so grateful for that music. Thank you. We feel the season turning. The early sunset glances through the red tinged leaves. These words I'm reading penned by a Yu Yu Lei worship associate for the Yom Kippur season. The newspaper, Ben Sol continues, arriving in the cool morning air, the flock of migrating swallows, a feeling of being on the edge of something new. These are the days of awe. A time to welcome a new year and a time to make the old year right before we lay it in its place on the shelf of our memories. We bless the wine and drink. We bless the braided bread and eat. We dip apple in honey and savor its sweetness. May the sound of the shofar carry us across the threshold where lie the possibilities we imagine for ourselves and our children. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day of the Jewish year. It comes as the tenth day of the Days of Awe, the first of which is Rosh Hashanah, the New Year. The ten days of the New Year are called Days of Awe because people feel, feel fear as well as reverence during this special time of judgment and forgiveness, atonement. It's a time of repentance, self-reflection. Yom Kippur's new year is a time to do an inventory of our living. In one story about the days of awe, it's not simply a self-inventory that you're invited to do. Each human's deeds are reviewed and judged by God for that year. This is where we hear about the book of life. Each year, the story says, there are three books open before God. The book of life, the book of death, and the book of judgment. The names of the good and the saintly are already inscribed in the book of life. And the names of the wicked, likewise already inscribed in the book of death. The rest of us are in the book of judgment. The names that will be there for the ten days as God reviews each one. The three books remain open the whole ten days, during which time people confess and atone and repent and help assure that their names will be found in the book of life for another year. Nothing is final until the books are sealed shut at the end of Yom Kippur. This is the prompt then to do your repentance work so that the deeds of your past year will result with your name being inscribed in the book of life. There was a clever little side story that I'd heard years ago and always enjoyed. A humble shopkeeper sits down to make a list of all of his misdeeds and, and the sins that he had committed over the course of the year. And at the same time, however, this shopkeeper made a second list as well and detailing all of the woes of the world attributable to God. And when he finished, he looked at the two lists and he said out loud, all right, I was not honest about the freshness of that fruit I sold last month, but you let that little girl down the street die from disease. I let my temper get the best of me when we were talking, when I was talking with my brother, but you created mosquitoes. I took your name in vain when I hit my thumb with a hammer, but that storm a few weeks ago ruined a lot of crops for the farmers in this area. And it went on until at last the shopkeeper said, so I'll tell you what, I'll forgive you if you forgive me and we can call it even and start fresh for the new year. I do find this little story delightful. Unfortunately, it's not what true repentance is about. True repentance, the real work of Yom Kippur, is to change our behavior and return to our better selves. In my little story, the shopkeeper bargains with God, but he doesn't ever improve or change. The text I'm using for today's sermon and for the common read uh, that we will be doing in October is uh, 
Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg's book on repentance and repair. Her book is an exploration of the teachings of Maimonides, Maimonides on the topic of repentance. She tells us that Maimonides' law of repentance outlines five steps for the work. Naming and owning harm, starting to change restitution and acceptance of consequences, apology, and making different choices. Now I read you this list not because I hope that you will all memorize it right away and get to work, but so that you will become curious and want to know more. So let me tell you a little more. The whole process starts with uh, a form of confession, naming and owning harm. In our society, this is a non-starter for a lot of people. Lawyers will tell you never admit fault or culpability. Indeed, we have a cultural norm of making non-apology apologies, of minimizing situations, focusing on our intentions, listening to listing our glowing character uh, traits and, and attributes and our reputation, or simply just outright denial. All of this instead of naming and owning harm. But ultimately, this is an act of truth-telling. Thing is, you're invited to do this truth-telling on yourself. I caused harm. And this is not just on the level of teaching our children to not lie. This is also about speaking truth uh, about how our institutions have caused harm or how our country has caused harm. We can't name and own harm caused with specifics if we can't do that, then we will never be clear to be able to move forward. And this is a pretty big deal. And yes, it's a very hard step if you don't understand how you've caused harm. So often, we cause harm without noticing or understanding that we have done so. Rabbi Ruttenberg clarifies, this is true for the person who chronically picks up the phone while their partner is talking. The person who borrowed without permission something they didn't realize was an heirloom. The cis person who, whose curious question of their trans neighbor dehumanizes them. The organizational structure that habitually silences women's voices at meetings. The city whose zoning laws reinforce structural racism and decades of disenfranchisement. To even get to that first step of the stages of repentance is significant, yet to name and own harm to another is still just step one. The next step is to begin to change. Now, when I read through this list, I thought, just begin to change? That's subtle. All we do in that step is start to change. We don't have to fully change. Another way to think about it, though, is this. Step one is to admit that you've been doing harm. Step two is to stop. Following these first two steps are the parts about making amends and making apologies. Step three, according to Ruttenberg, is restitution and accepting consequences. Although she acknowledges that Maimonides uh, didn't specifically include accepting consequences in, uh, the con as a concept when he was writing. But it is clear, she says, that our society needs that reminder. And following all of that, the apology is step four. It's interesting to note that there are several action steps prior to the part where we say the magic words of apology. Often, and I do this too, so I mean it when I say we, often we rush to begin the process with the apology. Let me begin by offering my deepest apology. But Maimonides outlines before we apologize, we have to already have named and owned the harm that we've committed. We've begun the process of why it happened and, to, and start to change our behavior. And we've even begun to make restitution and amends for that harm. And then we apologize. By that point, the apology is less likely to be a non-apology. I'm sorry you feel that way. 
I'm sorry if you were offended. I'm sorry, but it takes two to tango. I was just kidding. Can't you take a joke? Ugh, fine. I'm sorry. Are you happy now? There are countless ways to fake an apology, to pretend you care, to go through the motions just to get it over with. Because the real work is not just to say sorry and get forgiven. The real work is to repair what has been broken. This is not about forgiveness, but about repentance. The real work is to change. I saw a line a few weeks ago that said, changed behavior is the best apology. The last step in Maimonides' list for the laws of repentance is to make different choices. Start with naming and owning the harm, followed by starting to change. From there, we do that restitution and eventually make our way to apology. And all of that brings us to making different choices. Throughout the book, and if you join me for the Common Read workshops in October, you'll notice Rabbi Ruttenberg regularly calls the process of repentance a process of transformation. The end result is to be people who make different choices, who choose to live in a way that is more in keeping with the better versions of ourselves we long to be. There are some people who witness the process involved in Yom Kippur, the work of repentance, and think, it's all so focused on what you've done wrong and about what a bad person you must be. And in fairness, that is certainly one aspect of this holy work, yes. But it is also fair to say this process provides a way to face what is going on in the world and in our lives. The trouble in our lives and in the world will not be improved or repaired by cheap apologies and false declarations of humility. To make the world a better place, we need to make ourselves into better people. That means we do the work of repentance when we are called upon to do it. Yes, it means we need to face our faults and flaws. It means we must face the ways we have caused harm to others. But listen to this perspective from Hasidic teacher Rebbe Naman of Breslov. If you believe you can damage, believe that you can fix. If you believe that you can harm, believe that you can heal. This reframing, I think, is quite important. It reminds me of one of those traditional prayers and, and actions that happen during Yom Kippur. It's a prayer of confession with lines, uh, we have sinned. And I actually did this one year with the congregation I, as the prayer, the, the prayer of confession, where you, you make a small fist and you thump on your chest with each line, we have lied, we have stolen. This act of confession is done by everybody together, out loud, in the community. And it's an opportunity for people to publicly state a sin that they have committed in the preceding year, but to save some face while doing it, because everybody is saying it. Well, we did this on a Sunday together as Unitarian Universalists, and I heard a lot of people feel quite remarkably affected by it, and not in a good way. That is hard work. That is hard to do to yourself. This year, a rabbi colleague posted a loving confessional for Yom Kippur, uh, Rabbi Avi Weiss, and I'm going to offer it to you now in the spirit of that earlier quote, if you believe you can harm, believe that you can heal. And it is statements in the reverse. And if you are willing, when I say, we have loved, I invite you to put your hand on your chest, not as a fist. And if you feel so moved, repeat the phrase that I say and tap your heart. We have loved. We have blessed. We have grown. We have spoken positively. We have raised up. 
We have shown compassion. We have acted enthusiastically. We have been emphatic. We have cultivated truth. We have been merciful. We have given full effort. We have supported. We have contributed. We have healed. We have repaired. Now is the time for turning. For turning of the season and turning away from old habits that no longer serve. As we witness the turning of the leaves and the turning of the birds in migration, we turn as well with the new year. Now is the time for turning away from the harm we have caused, away from the wrongs we have done. It is time for turning toward the holy and the good, for returning to the better, more loving versions of ourselves. In a world without end, may it be so. Let us join in singing our